Don't forget to subscribe and ring that bell. Welcome back, friends. That's right. I called you a friend. You should feel special. We are going to continue the 2008 practice AP Calculus AB exam. We are going to do the second section. Well, it's section one, part A, but the second section of problems. I should stop saying section. We're going to do the second part of problems in section one, part A. Problems 11 through 20. Uh, we don't get a calculator, but that's okay. Strong like bull, my friend. My mind. She is strong like bull. Let's start with number 11. Number 11. What is the slope of the line tangent to the graph of y equals e to the negative x over x plus 1 at the point where x equals 1? All right, uh, basic problem. Slope is the same thing as derivative. So we're just finding the derivative of y at the point where x equals 1. And I see, my friends, a fraction, so I kind of know I'm going to use the quotient rule. So let's first find the derivative of y. It is, okay, low d high minus high d low. I draw a line and square below. That's what I say to myself every time I do these. So I got a fraction, and it's the low d high minus high d low. I draw this line and I square below, whatever low is. Now low refers to the denominator and high refers to the numerator, okay? So it is low, which is just x plus 1. d high. All right. Well, the derivative, okay, of e to the negative x is e to the negative x, okay, times the derivative of whatever that exponent is, which happens to be negative 1, okay, low d high, minus high, just as it is, times the derivative of below. The derivative of that blue highlight is just 1. I draw my line, and I square below. All right, that negative x throws me off uh, a little bit, but let's not worry, friends, because at this point, I'm not going to simplify anything yet. I'm simply going to put a 1 in for all my axes right there, right there, right there, right there. And let's do some nice appropriate math, shall we? We've got 1 plus 1 times e to the negative 1 times negative 1, so I'm just going to negate that. Okay, well, let me write that so it's nice here. Okay. So right here, I'm going to put a, a 1 in for this x, but then i got to multiply it times a negative 1. So it's going to be e, negative e to the negative 1 minus. All right, I've got e to the negative x again, and that's a 1, times 1, which, okay, it's itself all over 1 plus 1, and that's squared. All right, let's, um, let's, let's figure something pretty simple here. There's several different ways I can do this, and I am going to factor out my uh, e to the negative 1 because factoring never goes away. All right? In fact, I'm going to take out, yeah, I'll take out an e to the negative 1. I can take out a negative e to the negative 1 and make that positive. It don't matter. The bottom is 2, and 2 squared, okay, turns out to be 4. All right? So on the bottom of my fraction, I have a 4. The top is 2, okay? So let's kind of combine the top. So it's, uh, if I multiply it times a negative, it's negative 2e to the negative 1 minus e to the negative 1. Okay? And I can factor out that e to the negative 1. I'll just do this here. That will leave me negative 2 Minus 1? Is that what I got? That's okay. Yeah, it just seems weird to have 2. Yeah, because that's a 1 here. All right. So actually, I can combine those, can I? <gasps> I can. They are like terms. I don't even need to factor. Ooh, there are so many different... Like I said, there's so many different ways. Um, if I continue with the factoring, I get negative 3 times e to the negative 1. And that would be right here. 
what I was saying uh, about combining like terms instead of factoring, well, these are like terms. I have negative two e's to the negative one. Subtract another one e to the negative one, and that would still give me negative three e's to the negative one. So either way, that's what I end up with. Now, if I look at my answers, there's only one answer that has a three in there, in the numerator, and it has a negative response. That's choice B. Three in the numerator, and it's negative. So how does the E come in the bottom? When they simplify, they don't like negative exponents. So if my negative, 3 over 4, E to the positive 1, there you go. Choice B. Wow, that's a good one to start with. A lot of algebra. Number 12. If F prime of X equals 2 over X, and F of the square root of E is 5, then F of E is. All right. All right. F of E to F of the square root of E. I wonder if there are two ways to do this problem. There might be. And I think, okay, I can integrate. Okay, first thing we should know, okay, before we go over our possible ways. I can integrate F prime of X dx, and the result is f of x, okay? The derivative of f of x is f prime. But if I go backward, meaning integrate the derivative, I get the original function. So I can go ahead and do this um, here, like that. And I can try and figure out what this uh, equation is, put a plus c in there, use this initial value, come up with an equation, then plug in the e. Okay, I can do it that way, but I'm going to choose another way to do this. I am going to say that if I have bounds here from A to B, I can take F of B minus F of A. I'm going to set it like that, okay? Because I go to the original equation and put in the upper bound and subtract the lower bound. Because this will be the lower bound, A. This would be the upper bound B, and they already give me the value of the lower bound, so that's nice. So that's the way I'm going to do this problem. So I'm going to integrate F prime, which is 2 over X, DX. Okay, I'm going to do that from the square root of E, which is the same thing as E to the 1 half, to E. All right, and I'm going to make this uh, even easier. I'm going to pull the 2 out, this constant, 2 times the integration from e to the 1 half to e of 1 over x dx. Now that's very simple. That should equal my original equation with e in it minus my original equation with the square root of e, or e to the 1 half. Okay, sorry I'm running out of room there. So I already know what my original equation is to the square root of e, that's 5. So this is going to end up being minus 5 here. So I've got f of e, which they're asking me to solve, minus 5. This is given in the problem. I just got to solve this. And now I know what number it's set equal to. Okay? So let's go here. And the integration of 1 over x is the L n of x, okay? I want that for my lower bounds to my upper bounds. And, oh, don't forget, i got to multiply that by 2, the number that's out front here. Okay? That's going to equal f of e, which I'm trying to solve for, minus 5. All right. So I've got 2 times the ln of e minus the ln of e to the 1 half. And that's 1 minus a half. You should know the rules for natural log and E, okay? And that ends up being a half. Don't forget, I'm still multiplying it times 2. Half of 2 is 1. So I take my 1, and I set it equal to F of E minus 5. And I should know that 6 minus 5 is 1. Okay, I can add 5 to both sides if I want. But F of E should be 6. That's what they're asking you for. Yeah, 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 where is it? F of E, that equals 6. Choice D. Number 13, the integration of x cubed 
plus 1 squared. All right, we had in, in 11 and 12, we had some pretty algebra-heavy problems. Uh, this one's a little bit simpler. And I'm going to make it really simple because before I integrate, I'm going to FOIL this out. Okay? I'm going to FOIL that out. So x cubed plus 1 times x cubed plus 1. That gives me x to the 6th plus x cubed plus another x cubed plus 1. So I have x to the 6th plus 2x cubed plus 1. I haven't integrated. All I've done is foiled this. Now I'm going to integrate that. And there's my dummy variable. It's going to be a lot easier to integrate. All right? I know I add one to the exponent and then divide by that new exponent. Plus, I add one to the exponent, which is 4, and I divide by that new exponent. Plus, constants just get the exponent brought in. Excuse me. Constants just get the variable brought in. So that's just 1x. Plus some constants. All right. Well, it looks like if I do this right, I get 1 7 x to the seventh. Okay, so it's going to start like this or this. Yeah, so it can't be these. And then this is turns out to be one half x to the fourth, which is right here. So I have this one plus my c or plus my x plus my c. That is choice B. Number 14. Find the limit as h goes to zero of e to the 2 plus h minus e to the 2 all over h. Um, this should be, okay, very simple. Anytime I take a function, an original function, let's call it e to the x, and I subtract that from e to the x plus h, right, and I put it all over h, as the limit goes to zero, that's the definition of a derivative. Okay, that's a, they're just telling me to take the derivative. What the derivative of what? It's the derivative of whatever my original function is. My original function is always after the minus sign. Okay? Not only do we want to say the derivative of e to the x, they want that when my x is 2. So in other words, find the derivative of e to the x at an x value of 2. The derivative of e to the x is e to the x. Let's plug a 2 in. Guess what? There's your answer. That one was very simple as long as you made the association that the, what they gave us, the problem we started with, is the definition of a derivative using limits. Number 15. I got to be honest with you, when I first saw this, I didn't like it. But the more I looked at it, the more I understood it, and I dropped my disdain or dislike for it. I still don't think it's one of my favorite problems, but it's not horrible. The slope field for a certain differential equation is shown, well, to the bottom right, not above. Which of the following could be a solution for this differential equation with the initial condition 0, 1? This is a coordinate, okay? 0, 1 is going to be on my curve. So I'm going to go to 0, 1, and I'm going to dot right here. And I'm going to follow these lines of the slope field from 0, 1. It looks like it comes down, comes down, comes down, starts to kind of, and then it kind of flattens out like this. And same thing to this side. Comes down, comes down, flattens out like this. So right away, what I initially thought of and I figured out why I was, uh, you know, wrong to put this in my mind. Well, that looks like cosine, right? Cosine's that cup comes down like this and uh, comes down like this. But it's not cosine. How come? If this were the y-axis, the x-axis would be here. You see this point? It would dip below the x-axis. The graph I have looks like it flattens out at the x-axis. Okay? So it can't be A. All right? It cannot be B because B is a negative quadratic, I guess, a, 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 yeah, a negative quadratic. The, the number in front of my x squared is negative. So, again, that should go through the x-axis. It doesn't flatten out. 
Well, it's definitely not e to the x. That's just something that, that just goes kind of up like this. It's not that. All right, so we have two more choices. It is not the square root function. You should know the square root function kind of starts, it goes like this, or it's negative, it starts and comes down like this on my axis, wherever it goes. So by default, it's got to be choice y. And as I get closer to that, that uh, x-axis, okay, as, as x gets bigger and bigger and bigger, this would approach a value of 0 anyways. So that's why it would flatten out as I get closer to 0. Okay, it is choice E. Number 16. The derivative of f of x is the absolute value of x minus 2. Which of the following could be the graph? All right, uh, first of all, there is one major thing that should glaringly stick out to you that makes this problem easy. Derivative is the same thing as slope, isn't it? And absolute value bars makes everything positive. That means if I'm looking for the graph of f of x, the slope of that will always be positive. There will never be a negative slope. So right off the bat, I'm going to look to see if there's a negative slope anywhere. All right. Red marker time. That's a negative slope. Can't be this. Negative slope cannot be B. Negative slope cannot be C. Now, I look at D and E, okay? Positive slope, positive slope. There's a break, but where it continues from the break, it's still positive. Okay, and then I look at E. Positive slope, positive slope, positive slope. Zero, positive, positive. What's the one thing that pops out to you? At an X value of 2, it's either going to be undefined, or it's going to have a slope of zero. Okay? This one would have a slope that's zero at x equals two. And this will be an undefined slope at x equals two. Let's take a look at this right here. If I throw a two in for this x, does it become undefined or zero? It becomes zero. It's not undefined. My answer is choice E. Number 17, what is the area of the region enclosed by the graphs f of x, which is x minus 2x squared, and g of x, which is negative 5x? Area of the region, that screams to me integral. I'm going to have to integrate. Let's go to the thinner marker here. So I'm going to have to integrate, okay, the area between these two curves. So I, if I had to graph this, Okay, I don't get a calculator, but I should know this. Uh, the graph negative 5x, g of x, which we'll do in blue here, that looks something like this. There's a slope, it's just a straight line with a slope of negative 5. Okay, that's g of x. I know for a fact that this is a parabola that opens down. Okay, and I know if I pick uh, 0, it's going to be at the origin, 0, 0. So that's going to be one of the... Uh, bounds, upper bounds or lower bounds, okay? Now, if I pick the number 1, it's 1 minus 2, it's negative. If I pick the number 2, it's plus even more negative. Oh, my God. i got to figure out, is this going to be above or below the line? Okay, well, it, it opens down. Okay, it opens down. So, although... We don't have any positive values when I put an X. It's going to kind of look like this, kind of come through like this. It's going to look something like that, okay? Ballpark, all right? So I know that my lower bound is going to be at X equals zero. But what's my upper bound? i got to figure this out, and I don't get a calculator, okay? Which means I've got to set these two equal and solve. One of the answers is going to be zero. What's the other one? They're making us do some work here. So minus 5x equals x minus 2x squared. So bring everything from the right over to the left. Plus 2x squared. Plus 2x squared. Minus x. Minus x. <whistles> bang, bang. Equals 0. We've got 2x squared minus 6x. Beautiful. If I take out a 2x, because factoring 
never goes away, I get x minus 3 equals 0. So there you go. x equals 0 and x equals 3. This is my upper bound. Okay? So I'm going to have to integrate the area between those curves. Please remember, if I'm integrating from 0 to 3, okay, it is always the upper curve minus the lower curve, okay? The upper curve is f of x, okay? The lower curve is g of x. This area in between them that I'm filling in, the, the curve on top is f of x, okay? So that's my f of x. So I want to say f of x minus g of x. Don't forget your dummy variable. We went through a lot just to set up that integral, okay? So let's do this. We've got x minus 2x squared, that's f of x, minus g of x, which is negative 5x, dx, and I'm integrating that from 0 to 3. Let's clean it up even more, shall we? So I've got x minus 2x squared. I subtract a negative plus 5x dx from 0 to 3. That gives me x squared over 2 minus, oh boy, 2x cubed over 3 plus 5x squared over 2. That is quite... I mean, none of those fractions simplify those little sons of guns. But you know what I do appreciate? One of the bounds is a zero. And when I throw a zero in, everything goes bye-bye. So let's throw our three in first. We've got three squared over two minus two times three cubed ugh, over three plus five times three squared over two. Upper bounds. Minus, when I put the lower bound in, 0, 0, 0, it's just 0. So I don't really care about this. I've just got to simplify what I have in front of me right here. 9 over 2 minus, oh my God, it's 27 uh, times 2 is 54. I could do 27 divided by 3. I could just say minus 18. Okay. Plus, oh my God, 945 over 2. All right, well... I see everything is over 2 except a middle term. So let's make this 18 is the same thing as 36 over 2. Oh, finally some easy, easy math. All right. So I have, uh, all right, 36, negative 36, plus 45 is 9, plus another 9 will give me 18 over 2, which reduces to 9. That, my friends, was a strenuous problem. Okay, so, I mean, I guess I'll show you that work right there one more time. So we, we got that, and it should reduce to 9. So let's go back up here, and our answer is choice D. Let's get off this problem. Woo! 18. For the function f, f prime of x is 2x plus 1, and f of 1 is 4. What is the approximation for f of 1.2 found by using the line tangent of the graph of f at x equals 1? Okay, this really isn't that bad of a problem considering the one we just did. Um, I need to find the equation for f, the equation of a line. Line tangent. So right off the bat, y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1. And every time we do this, I tell my students, we need a coordinate, our x and our y, and then we need a slope, all right? And the slope is generally the most work, but based on what they gave us, this seems like it's going to be really easy. This is a coordinate. x is 1, y is 4. They give us this. Train your brain to know that's a coordinate. So we've got y minus 4 equals, I still don't know my slope, it's x minus my x value of 1. Again, x1, y1. My slope is the derivative, and they give me that. So that's a nice break. So let's find the slope at what value of x? When x is 1. They even tell you here when x is 1. So I want f 
the derivative of f at 1. 2 times 1 plus 1 okay, is 2 plus 1, which is 3. Okay. My slope is 3. Now, if we are asked to find f of 1.2 equals something, again, it's a coordinate. When x is 1.2, what's my y? All right? And we're going to use the equation that we just found. All right? Let's add 4 to both sides just to make it y equals. So we got my y, which is what I'm looking for. 3 times x minus 1 plus 4. They want us to find an x value. Well, they want us to find a y when x is 1.2. All right. 1.2 minus 1 is just 0.2. Well, 3 times 0.2 is 0.6, and i got to still add that to 4. 4.6. D, 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 D. Got him. We got him. Hang in tight. we got two more problems. Number 19. Let f be the function given by f of x equals x cubed minus 6x squared. The graph of f is concave up when. We need to find intervals of x when our graph is concave up. Concave up means the second derivative is positive or bigger than zero. Okay, so first of all, we need to find a second derivative. Easy. The first derivative is 3x squared minus 12x. The second derivative is 6x minus 12. The first thing we need to do when we want to try and find the sign, meaning positive or negative, of the second derivative is to find the points of inflection. That means let's find where the second derivative is equal to 0 first. Those are called inflection points. I'm going to abbreviate that. Okay, and then we're going to put in a number line, and we're going to check the values around the inflection points to see what makes a second derivative, in this case, positive, or what could make it negative. So if we set this equal to 0, well, I mean, I know it's going to be 2. <laughs> Let's add 12 to both sides. Yeah, there you go. 6x equals 12, so x is 2. This is where I have an inflection point. So let's put this in a number line, shall we? Let's go to the left here. Okay, and just like critical points for the first derivative equals 0, the second derivative can have an inflection point when the second derivative is undefined, not just 0. However, there's nothing that makes our polynomial undefined. It is just a string of characters. There's no fractions, square roots, whatever. Right, so when x has a value of 2, my second derivative has an inflection point or a value of 0. I'll put ip for inflection point. So I'm going to check some values on, on the other sides of this. Okay, let's try 0 here, x is 0, and x is, I don't know, 3. I'm going to put these two values da, 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 into the second derivative, which is 6x minus 12. All right, I'm going to see if it, we get a positive or negative value for our second derivative. All right, so let's start with a 0. If I take 6 times 0 minus 12, well, that ends up being negative 12. That means my second derivative will have negative values to the left of 2. We don't want the negative. We want the positive values. All right, well, let's, let's try our 3. 6 times 3 is 18 minus 12. That's a positive 6. Now, I don't care about the 6. I just care about the sign. Here are my positive values. Anytime we're bigger than 2. All right? Anytime x is greater than 2, that is choice A. Number 20, our last one for this video or this part of Section 1, Part A. If g of x is x squared minus 3x plus 4, and if f of x is the derivative of g, hmm, then the integral from 3 to 1 of f of x dx is. All right. Okay. First of all, the way I handle these problems, and I suggest 
the way you handle these problems is, anytime I see an f of x, I should think of it as g prime of x. So guess what I'm going to do with this f of x? I'm going to make that a g prime of x. It's the first thing I'm going to do here. So let me take this. I'm the integral from 3 to 1 of f of x. That's the same thing as g prime of x. Okay? And, uh, well, I know for a fact, okay, I know for a fact that if I have g of x, and I have g prime of x, and g double prime of x, these are all one derivative away, aren't they? But if I go backwards, that's an integral, isn't it? Guess what that means? If I have this, and I'm integrating it, the result will be g of x. So this will equal g of x. And better yet, since we have bounds, it's going to be g of my upper bound minus g of my lower bound. And that's what I'm going to do. And they give me g right here. So all I've got to do is throw my upper bound of 3 into g of x and subtract throwing in the lower bound of 1 into g of x. Right, so it really isn't, I mean, this isn't bad at all in terms of algebra. You just got to make the connection that when you integrate a derivative, you get the original function, okay? Uh, the previous problems, 11 through 19, there was pretty heavy algebra in there. There always is. A little bit more in this one than others, but we're cool. We got this. Let's put 3 into g of x. So it's x squared minus 3 times x plus 4. Okay, so this is the upper bound. Minus, I do the same thing throwing a 1 in. It's x squared minus 3 times x plus 4. Okay, let's throw our 3 in our upper bound. 3, 3. Our lower bound is 1, so it's 1, 1. Let's do some math. All right, 9 minus 9 plus 4. These cancel. I have 4 minus. Okay, 1 minus 3 plus 4, oh, that's 5 minus 3. Is that 2? Is that 2? Is my answer 2? Son of a gun, it is. Look at that. I like the number 2. Anyways, it is choice C. We're done. Whew. Man, I feel like I just boxed at least 6, 7 rounds of a 12-round fight. But, okay, but we are done. Like the video, follow me because that's the only way you get notifications when I put up future videos like maybe problems 21 through 28 of this exam and so forth, the free response questions. Uh, make a comment if there's something you saw that you do differently that you think is good. I like learning new stuff, okay? Um, or just say hi or if there's a test you want to see me do, go ahead, put that down there. Uh, we're done. Like the video, that helps me. I will see you later for the next video. Bye-bye. Don't forget to subscribe and ring that bell.